The only answer I can offer is you need to subject yourself to an initiation process where you are in a group of people that know how to foster that initiation. And the only one I can think of, the only one I can think of that I advocate for young men is jujitsu. Yes. Because there you are on a path, there you are working against your own ego, there you are completely vulnerable and reliant to the goodwill of other people. You are watching community play out firsthand in a very real sense with no dress ups on it and you are crafting yourself what a treat to have you back my brother rocco you are a poet a philosopher an author a father a husband a friend and just a really great guy so it's always a pleasure we connect Thank you so much for having me back, Lawrence. And uh, I'm sure it's going to be a more spacious, nourishing conversation today. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah, one thing I'm really impressed by you is I feel like you've you had so many ideas and your ability to explain them in in a poetic and cutting way that really really resonates with people has has really increased. And I know this is the third book you've written in two years. And I'm sure just that even the process, you know, I just finished my first book on real estate, just the process of, of organizing things in, in your head and then on paper, I'm sure that must have been so clarifying, but I'd love to talk a little bit about just how you've changed and, and your ability to communicate your ideas and how some of the things that, that you've realized in the last maybe six months have, have come about. Yeah. It, it makes me think of a quote that you often mention about Soren Kierkegaard, which life has to be lived forward, but can only be understood backwards. And it seems like even though I counted myself as having really good insights on many things, including my own self-awareness, you know, it's almost like I was moving through just a different kind of blind spot in, in myself. And what I've realized since in hindsight is I was going through some kind of functional psychosis, actually. So imagine taking a, a toddler and then putting them in Disneyland and getting them on the internet. Just the sheer overwhelm of what they're experiencing would probably overload their language and it would come out in in a form of intensity now i've mentioned to you before i'm, I'm highly neurodivergent <clears throat> that doesn't mean i'm autistic but i'm something in that neck of the woods something that relates to information differently relates to patterns differently relates to communication and people differently and i think over the period of time if i watch myself the conversations i was having the ideas i was trying to articulate it's almost like I encountered a dam wall, a, a dam of relevance, and my mouth was the, the sluice gate. And so everything came out like a fire hose, which if someone doesn't have a frame of reference, it just comes across as sheer intensity. And, you know, some of it was learnt mellowness, but some of it was just genuinely arrived at. And I also think if you sit with a problem or a vocation or an intention for long enough. If you really care about it in the world and you want it to live in the world, the only way it's going to live in the world is through exchange with people. And so I've had to put down the fire hose and pick up the, the coffee cup and the espresso cups and um, sometimes spoons even, you know, and start, ex well, that's always going to be more effective. Even if I can only share one cup, of something meaningful with someone that's one cup exchanged that's one little cup of my dam of philosophy and relevance and what i think i downloaded from the the universe if it mean if it's meant to be one cup at a time c'est la vie mm. it you reminds know, because me if you aim the fire hose at people they they capture nothing it reminds me is it was it nietzsche when he was teaching would only have a couple of uh, students at his lectures because they just couldn't the, the, his his ideas were just so intense and and um, strong, and they just may, maybe didn't communicate them so well. And then you see so, so many times in history these great figures that we appreciate only years later. You know, same with yeah. Van, Van Gogh, the artist. You know, he he was he died penniless, but now his paintings are worth you know they're priceless. You know, multiples of millions. I want dollars. my rewards in life, Lawrence. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I don't after. want my rewards in heaven. Yes, but I I know we've had that conversation yeah. before where. You said, you know, I don't want to dumb down my message to resonate with a society that, that is all about baits and these little annoying reels for, you know, it's a big thorn in both of our sides that society's gone the way where no one has, you know, people think in 
240 characters and little 20 second clips and it's it's really yeah. hard to do deep work but mm. precisely <laughs> when i think about myself i'm always happiest when i don't have distractions and i can get into something a bit deeply and that's one of the reasons that i love podcasting is that you know my phone's off and we're just connecting and we're talking and you don't get that too much in day-to-day -day life especially not in a business like mine mm. where i'm always getting bothered by clients and, and calls and texts and emails all day every day yeah yeah look i resonate with that and yeah of course man but this is the world we live in and i think if there's one word we can like reach out and if you did a poll on uh, ten thousand people and say what's the thing that bothers you the most at the moment they might give you a lot of reasons but if you help them with their language i think what they'll agree is that the most common feeling that we're all sharing is overwhelm yeah i had that exact and it's that wonderful yeah. expression where you say the problem is when your inputs exceed your throughputs and i remember That's having right. i thought of you i thought of you in that expression a couple of days ago because it's one of those where i didn't get the best night's sleep and i had a really busy day at work and i felt like i had so many things coming at me and so many people expecting responses and i was like man th these inputs are just coming in too quickly and so many people go through day after day week after week month after month living like that and uh, i remember that yeah. was advice you gave me many months ago you said just you need more space and that's so true it's just, and that's one of the reasons that i loved your your latest book is because anytime i can actually read a paperback as opposed to like listening to an audiobook while I'm doing something else. But when I can actually sit and read and just be present with my thoughts and 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 reading reading the paper, it just makes me so happy because it's just, it's such it's such a treat that I don't get to do that much anymore. Yeah. So the two words keep coming to me, spacious and nourishing. And they really relate to the two um, illnesses of our time, which is overwhelm and meaninglessness. So not only are we overwhelmed with so much stuff and so many things to do and so many pressing demands on our attention, so little of those are actually what we would call sacred or special or meaningful in our lives, but they're, they're somehow necessary nevertheless. And you have to be present to pause, to process all of that massive volume of overwhelm to make sure you don't miss anything that is relevant. So, you know, the onus is completely on you. In one way, I think we've been trained by social media to be able to process an enormous amount of data and then our brains have become trained to pick out what is and isn't relevant to us, especially if we've got a discipline of trying to be more discerning in our streaming, in our social media. But there's always a downside to an adaptation and the downside is that when you kind of filter the noise out, you also filter out the beauty and it, it becomes just this efficiency exchange of, you know, how much can I do at the shallowest level to, and still remain uh, relevant in the exchange. That starts taking the connection out of things, really. So the two words, spaciousness and nourishing for me, everything that I'm trying to do now, including this conversation, needs to be spacious and nourishing to attack exactly those two illnesses, which is overwhelm and, and meaninglessness. Well, I'm going to read you what you wrote. Our whole modern world is a busy place of processes and cold interfaces, none of which are designed with the human soul in mind. We think we're struggling with poor mental health without realizing it's actually a form of poor spiritual health. And I just absolutely love that. Can, we, can you talk a little bit, Rocco, about your the title of the book? It's called The Hearth and the Well. Which half. I um oh. half, sorry, as an English person, I had to look up look up that's an, it's an old English <laughs> word. I should I should have known better. But can you talk a little bit about about that? So the whole book really, Lawrence, lives under this premise, which is exactly what we're talking about, man. It, it, the premise of the book is that soul is what is missing when life feels wrong. And so we know that life feels wrong at the moment for everyone. But we can't quite put our finger on it because so many of us are still looking for answers in the mirror or answers out there. It's, it's, it's those guys with the red ties, it's those guys with the blue ties, it's men, it's women, it's white people, it's black people, it's the gays, it's the, it's the, the trans people. It's, it's always another group of them and other, which is such a primitive way of finding meaning in the world is through conflict and through competition. It really is. It's becoming a redundancy that we have to outgrow. And if if our illness is, I'm just gonna say a bunch of words and I invite people to like really connect with that and see if this resonates in your life isolated. 
Sometimes we feel isolated in our problems or in our circumstance. Depleted. You know, we're trying to be the best parents, the best fathers, the best husbands, the best friends, the best colleagues, the best business people, the best whatever. And the job always seems too big for us. If you're really connected with a sense of purpose, the job's always going to feel too big for you. And the only recourse you have is to dig deeper in yourself. So we feel isolated in that. We feel depleted. We become anxious because it's too much and we daren't put it down. And tomorrow more is coming. We feel disconnected sometimes from our own families, from conversations, from meals that we're eating, from our bodies, from our bodies. We feel disconnected from our sense of calling that we once enjoyed as a child, our sense of wonder from where we got our imagination and our creativity. And we feel meaningless about our pursuits that when things become troubled in the world, the old question comes back as to what's the point of it all, right? And for me, the the medicine to that had to be its own opposite. So the answer to isolation is connection and integration. And the answer to meaninglessness is obviously meaning and poignance and purpose and relevance. And to depletion, therefore, it must be replenishment and it must be restoral and renewal. And then instead of throwing highbrow philosophy at this or psychology at this, which are both accurate, they're just very dry. And in that dryness and that coldness that they offer as an answer to those problems, lay the answer because what we're looking for is warmth and we're looking for something that touches us and puts a hand on our shoulder that isn't well here's the cold hard detailed fact here's the latest hot take from alex formosi here's the the uh, tim ferris's seven tips for being a, a a mensch that's all wonderful but like i said i don't think it's mental health that we're struggling from i th you know there's a beautiful saying by a guy called Jiva Krishnamurti, which I just live with this saying, it says, it's no sign, it's no measure of good health to be well-adjusted in a profoundly sick environment. And so we have to go back to what we can manage and control. And what we can manage and control is three things, man. It's our presence, it's our intentionality, and it's our discernment. And if we mean to explore ideas like renewal, replenishment, connection, connecting with purpose, feeling revitalized. There, is, there are examples of those sorts of ideas that we can explore and see what the metaphor teaches us. And for me, those two wonderful metaphors were the hearth, which is a fireplace, and the well, the wellspring. And both of them are like these metaphors of renewal one of them that we can actually become intimately involved in by, by cleaning the fireplace out, metaphorically speaking, by gathering the right kind of fuel, by having that diligence when you're going out in the world to make sure you're collecting the right kind of things that can feed and fuel your fire, your vitality. So we, we can clear the fireplace, we can gather the right fuel, and then there's a whole art, a whole craft to tending a fire, to kindling a fire and tending it. And, you know, one of the things that I say in the book is any fool can start a fire, but it takes uh, the human in us to contain and control and tend and moderate that fire and make sure the size of the fire is related to the size of the job, whether we're metaphorically cooking a meal or inviting friends into a talking circle and something that is spacious and nourishing, you know? And that speaks a lot to our own sense of self-moderation, self-regulation, regulation of our tempers, regulation of our intensity, of our shadow sides, which comes out everywhere, you know? And then finally, just the art of sitting by a fire, you know, just that quiet time, like you said, sitting, reading a book, where you're not, there's no more doing to do. It's just your reflection time, taking stock, sitting with your griefs in the world, sitting with your forgivenesses, processing the stuff that if you mean to have good spiritual health, you actually have to work through the backlog of. That doesn't mean you have to work through all of it, but you take a bit down every now and again when you get to that phase in your life. And you just sit with a bit of it. You rethink conversations and you rethink the way that you showed up and you consider 
how you'd like to show up stepping forward. So that's the the modality of the of the hearth, really, which is unpacked in the book, and we can talk about that. Do you want to talk about the well quickly as well? Yes, please. Yeah, so the hearth to me is something that you have to kind of you have to drive the process. So it's a bit more a bit more yang, a bit more instigative, a bit more initiatory from from ourselves. And so there's things that we need to do to mind our own self, which are internal and even though we're out in the world metaphorically gathering wood or whatever the case, the job is really owned and driven by us you know when you're sitting by that fire in the middle of a cold winter night you know that you are enjoying the fruits of your own efforts your own diligence your own presence your own intentionality your own discernment because you had to be intentional and discerning as to the wood you gathered the cleaning of the fireplace the preparing having the right tools in in around you to be able to manage that and of course i mean this in a purely metaphorical sense as well right these are our our practices, uh, the way we shape our environments to be able to look after ourselves in that way and our families in that way. But the well is something different. It's it's not something that originates in us. You know, you'd have to go out to the river. You'd have to go to the fountain to collect your water. And sometimes the well stopped being a thing in the here. It's not like going to the, the kitchen faucet and turning it on and getting some water. It's where you have to leave the familiar. You have to go somewhere else, whether it's a trip away with friends, whether it's a, a walk in the woods by yourself, whether it's a, a kind of uh, metaphorical journey that you take, just stepping away from a relationship, from a problem, from the closeness of your own life and the intensity or dullness that you were holding the conversation of life in. We've all done this. You know, you, you badger away at something for a while, until you realize that the answer is not going to be found inside you. And you kind of have to go take that pilgrimage to the metaphorical well. You have to go look for an answer outside of yourself. You have to eventually admit to the world and to yourself that you're not the source of everything. You have to connect with that vulnerability again and that that state of not knowing, I don't know. But, you know, if you wash it clean of the nonsense of religion is actually a form of prayerfulness. It's just to say... I'm I'm sitting with that question on my heart. I don't have the answer. I'm in no rush to find the answer, but I'm going to make my way to this well and then see what I see when I get there. And then sometimes not even get the answer I was looking for and then have to come back. So people, one example of doing that is like when people do an ayahuasca ceremony. Very rarely do people do those sort of things just for kicks. There's some sort of itch they want to scratch, some answer they're looking for in the world, some depth they're trying to find inside themselves. And you go there with a question in the hopes that the question is going to be answered in that moment. And sometimes it isn't completely answered in that moment. And then you have to walk back, come home and explain to your family why you've been away, why you've been doing this crazy thing. And then you, it takes all the time afterwards to actually make sense of that little um, sojourn, that little um, there and back again. So the hearth and the well, for me, these two modalities related to fire and to water about restoring that sense of vitality and essentiality and presence in our lives, sometimes through the efforts that we have to do here and, and within our own homes and within our own our own bodies. And sometimes it's the it's the outward looking journey um, where you don't have the answer. We have to go somewhere to do something and experience something that is going to possibly change you because it's the journey away from the certainty and from the, I know what the answer is, or I know where to find it. And that can show up in many ways. And really, that's the the premise of the hearth and the well. Yeah. When you were talking, you just reminded me, I had this beautiful chart of memory that came back. And it was when I was in my late teen years, and I was just finishing high school. And it was, um, I think, the start of the summer in England, lovely weather. And my parents had a little backyard. And I just remember being there, and obviously it's pre-cell phone, pre-internet, and just spending hours just sitting out there kind of processing life, I guess. And now, like if you mentioned that beautiful, my favorite quote about life have, has to be lived forward, but can only be understood when we look backwards. Looking back at that time, I think, man, what if I had grown up today where I was just, instead of just sitting there and just trying to figure out life as I was becoming a man, I'd have been inundated with a thousand things on, on Instagram and TikTok and 
a million messages from friends. Oh, what exactly? And I just kind of think, you know, with both parents of toddlers and how lucky we are to have grown up in the era we grew up in. And I just think <laughs> it's so difficult now for kids growing up with all these distractions. Man, and the simple, you know, everyone's got what they think is a simple answer to this. Oh, I'll just limit their screen time. Just do this. Just ban TikTok. You know, that's a little bit like trying to ban the rain or ban the flood that's coming or our, our ideas. I put in the book several times this idea that the language, our language is too small for the territory that we've already stumbled into. Mm. Our paradigm that we're operating in is too primitive for the reality that is actually unfolding around us that our children are native to. And if we don't wise up, and I don't mean wise up by listening to more podcasts and getting more busy with our, our knowledge and our cleverness and our knowing, I mean wise up in the old sense mm. of the wisdom of elders and of custodians. How do you bridge the relevance of the past to them with a future that you, you are a stowaway in, that you don't have a ticket to the game for? And just that question of realizing that, you know, however disconnected you are from the era that came before you, you know, you can look at them and raise your eyebrow and go, oh, what fools they were. Every era thinks that the era before them were a bunch of old fuddies that didn't know what's, what was going on. And every era before looks at the one that comes next and thinks what an ungrateful bunch of entitled assholes. Mm -hmm. And if we can't see that that pattern is eternal, how can we become or facilitate with them the relationship with the the grandfathers, the elders? How can we bring some of that wisdom to them where we're not showing up as parents that are cheering on their every average move or helicoptering them and managing them to death? How do we actually get out of our own story, our own the arc of our own journey, which is not relevant to them? We're a stepping stone for them. Mm. And how do we get out of that? context so that we can enter into at times or be mindful of the conversation that they are having with life and that they will be forced to have with life and then how do we give them the tools to choose the right bridges to cross over bridges because they're on their own journeys you know we're just the as Khalil Gibran says the bows from which the arrows fly but they've got their own onward journey we just the ones that stay behind. And I think for any parent really, or for anyone that I, that resonates with the idea of being an elder or a custodian in our society, could be a custodian of anything, jujitsu, running, a certain style of music, podcasting, um, the, the invitation to masculinity and manhood, with so, which so many young people are looking for and looking for in the wrong places. I mean, how are we showing up as custodianship of the institution of masculinity, of the institution of marriage, of the institution of um, brotherhood of men, which is not juvenile, which is not a, a Peter Pan syndrome. There, there's so many ways that we can honor that and, and identify with that calling, but we're not even asking those questions of ourselves because we're so wrapped up, so wrapped up in the the smallness of the conversation and the tightness of our own of our own arc of relevance and and i'm just going to keep coming back to these words like um spacious and nourishing and how can we create more space in which something can become renewed or revitalized or nourished you know that feeling that everyone's had it where you spend 20 30 minutes just swiping on on an, uh, a social media app like instagram and then after you just feel so empty and awful. Or I have it sometimes where I'm just royalty and yeah, I'm being productive, but I'm looking, I'm, ju I'm juggling between a phone, texting calls, and then a laptop with emails and I'm going back and forth. And I'm just, you know, hours can go by two, three hours and I just feel so just off. But then if I go outside, take my shirt off and I am barefoot on grass and I just get in the sun and I just walk around for 10 minutes, just in peace with no technology, I feel so rejuvenated. And that's that idea of just, it's so obvious. We, we evolved over hundreds of thousands of years to be in a certain environment, to be outside in nature, to be connected with the earth. And then this is just such a, from a 
from an evolutionary time frame, this is just a, not even a blink of time where we're suddenly just in this te high tech world. And I just think it's so, it's such a struggle because like you said, it's deranging. It's, right. But I mean, it's inevitable in so many different, in so many different job titles. You know, I, I, <clears throat> I think about my buddy who's a dentist and I think, man, it's so nice because when he's doing a procedure for two hours, he has to be focused, like his phone's in the other room, but there's other occupations. And I was talking about my own because it's in real estate where I'm just, I'm, I'm tied to it to an extent on and off seven days a week. So I have to be very deliberate about this is me time. I'm not going to have it. Um, and it's hard. It's really hard. I think I'm an incredibly disciplined really person hard. and I struggle with it, Rocco. So I can only imagine with people that are less disciplined than me, um, you know, how it's impacting their life. Yeah. Um, I think that's such a, an important question, actually. And to me, it's got to do with craft and calling, which the book touches on a lot. Craft and calling. It's that we have this idea today of a profession, but this is not what a profession is. A profession was originally the word that um, seminaries use or religious people used when they were entering the ceremony, when they were going to devote their entire lives to a contemplative life <clears throat> following the, uh, the the meditative contemplative aspect of a, of a religion which is a mystical journey you know and that was what their calling was they were called to do that and then later on those professions the word profession got borrowed and and shifted into trades you know like painter or or sculptor or um blacksmith or shoemaker and uh, you would have to apprentice yourself to a master until eventually you you could never surpass your master in his craft because he was a master of his craft, but you could become a master in your own right eventually. And that was this this beautiful marriage of craft and calling so that what you were doing was tied more inherently to your sense of purpose and meaning in life, your identity, your sense sense of relevance to the world and validation in the world, which means you wouldn't be looking for the kind of things for validation that we look for today, which is our trappings of status and chest puffing and internet whoring and because people actually believed in what they were doing and they felt connected to that. Now, we think when somebody says, what's your profession, they'll tell you their job. And if we're really honest with ourselves, we didn't arrive at some of these jobs through a profound sense of calling. We arrived there through convenience because it was the path that was open to us and because we had inherited the demands of a lifestyle that cost so much, that had such relentless momentum that we actually didn't have the opportunity to stop and reconnect with what we would have liked to do instead, number one. And number two, it's not like the world is really like a gallery or an arcade of opportunities that you just have to wander down and then choose the door that delights you and walk through it. We're just walking through a desert of meaninglessness, of overwhelm, of noise, of disconnection, and trying to find meaning in our current desert of meaning, mm. trying to find relevance and poignance in something that has so little of it around people that have normalized the meaninglessness the irrelevance of what they're doing and have made something that is irrelevant relevant which is glitz and glamour and and shininess and uh, the latest whatever and we're all just it's almost like that um the time of i've been watching that show franklin on apple tv then you watch the era when franklin was in france courting the french to aid against the english for the for the sake of their own independence and you look at the period dress and the opulence and the makeup that men wore and the white wigs that everybody wore. Outside the context of that cultural framing, everything looks ridiculous. Yeah. It looks ridiculous. But then you had this entire society that thoroughly, on, on two continents, that thoroughly normalized this. Mm -hmm. How so, many things, one, one last thing, how many things that we're doing today in life are people going to look 100 years from now and just giggle with how ridiculous it is to wear a tie or to um, hand your business card out as if this is some form of, of, of heartfelt connection between two human beings. Now, obviously it's necessary, but we normalize this far beyond its, its utility, right? These things. The question underneath all of this is, can you really be happy 
because you you use discipline and a very disciplined mind, which is actually your calling. Your calling is to craft Lawrence into a mensch through the actual vocation of a father, of a husband, of a friend, of a judoka, of many things. And and the work is just the means to an end, you know. You it's not like you don't take your work seriously, but you take your work seriously because you take your real vocations seriously. Now, other people don't have that connection. They don't have that blessing that you have of of the kind of psychological and philosophical education that you've given yourself. And so they can't understand that there is a way through, even in the midst of the desert of meaninglessness or of overwhelm, where you can actually go, sure, I, I, there's a lot of things that I have to do so that I can do what I want to do. Mm. But even there, it's on me to exercise the tension, the balance, to hold the impossible tension in the middle, to straddle the paradox of it all, and to keep uh, uh, you know, attaching myself to that discipline of coming back, coming back, coming back to the things that center me, ground me, nourish me, fulfill me. And it's just an art that we don't know how to do. It's a, cra it's a craft, you know. We don't understand the craft of how to find and connect with our own calling in the middle of meaninglessness mm. or of raising a toddler or of you. Yeah. I love what you said about that Franklin show now looking back, you know, the absurdity of so many things they were doing and it was just assumed normal. And I love that Krishnamurati quote about, you know, you don't, it, it's a no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society because I think about that all the time. And I love, you've got a couple of my favorite quotes in this book, but it, I think that's such an important thing to think about, especially when you're young, you just assume, okay, I see people on Instagram with money, so I'm going to chase money. And a lot of time people only realize their best years are behind them. They've given decades of life They've ruined their health. They've ruined their relationships to get to a certain level. I'm a partner in a law firm now and I'm making all this money. And what do I have? My life's empty. I have no health. I have no good relationships. Like I've wasted my life. And um, yeah. it, so I, I love the fact that you talk about that. But what do you think now that we're doing? What are some of the things that you think maybe in a century we'll look back and say, God, I can't believe they did that? Give children access to social media, I think, for a yes. start. Yes. That's one of them. The other one is the amount of sugar and caffeine we consume and normalize, and we criminalize psychedelics. I think we've got those those two quite quite wrong. The shallowness that we normalize, the um, incendiary antagonistic politics that we normalize. We're really animated from the fringes. We're not animated from the center, from our heart. We're animated from our absolute extreme edges in everything. I think if we go the way I mean us to go or I wish us to go, our devotion to redundant religions will become laughable because they're really fairy stories at the end of the day. Sorry to interrupt, but that, that notion, I feel like a lot of the problems today are because people left the big three, you know, ma mainly Christianity. They left Christianity and then they have this void that they're searching for. And whether it's veganism or trans rights or politics or, or you know, fill in the blank, they've just replaced one yeah. one set of ridiculousness with another. So, you know, I, I always consider myself an atheist from when I was very young. And now I, I I don't think I'm religious, but I realize that I think it's it's much better for most people to believe in something, I guess. I think I think they're much sure. happier and better humans. Sure. But with, with everything we know and understand now, you know, to me, the answer is going to be more in work like this. It's something that is spiritually nourishing and relevant and poignant without telling you a bullshit story or without capitalizing on the human psychological funny bone reaction of shame and guilt. And I, I think it's prescribing to people how they should think and feel based on a 2000 year old treatise with such limited uh, relevance of life experience and context to what was in those religions and books. That's what I mean. It's, it's, if you took an intelligent group of people down and you just explained the problem to them without mentioning religion or Christianity or Islam, or and you just said, okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to try and give people a coherent form of spirituality, but what we're going to do is we're going to give them a lot of allegory and pretend that the allegory is actually true that it is actually the word of some God in the sky who has a lot of puritanical laws, a lot of contradiction, a lot of myopia, 
in terms of ethical and moral myopia. Um, it's going to look like it was suitable for something for 2,000 years ago, but we're going to try and import it and overlay it on the modern consciousness and pretend that there's nothing wrong. It, it, it won't be at the heart of our politics and our business, but it will still underwrite the core operating system in terms of what, when we think of humanism and ethics and morality, at the bottom of that, whether we want to admit it or not, is still the borrowed Christian notion of goodness and merit and virtue and commandment. And such. I mean, our laws are really built around those sorts of things. People will say to you, that seems like a really long, long, long way, obscure, obfuscating way to something that could be really simplified. So you, on the one side, you've got religion, which is trying to describe the fundamental and the eternal and make out as if it's completely true in their hot take that you lock in stone once, but the world is always unfolding and changing, but they wrote it down once, it makes no sense, and you have to keep reinterpreting it. And on the other side, you've got science, which is admitting of nothing warm and and mm -hmm. personal in this world that one can have a relationship with or two. And they're also trying to look on the eternal and the fundamental and trying to explain it, but they never say, we know what the answer is. They always begin with the premise of, I don't know, it could be this, it could be that. That's the premise of a working hypothesis. So you've got these two extreme polarities, both trying to explain the same thing from a completely different contexts, and they currently believe that they're irreconcilable. Now, the one is too hot and too flimsy, and the other one's too cold and too rigid. And we really need to find out how we take the threads of both and weave them together in a way that satisfies both seekers and skeptics, both scientists and um, people looking for that form of spiritual connection in the world. Because at the end of the day, we are the walking paradoxes that have to try and make sense of those things anyway, because you can believe what you want about any of those big three religions. But when you put a bowl of soup in a microwave, you trust science. When you climb on an airplane to cross the Atlantic, you trust science. Mm -hmm. And often our misgivings about science or religion are just due to the fact that we've seen them practice badly from poor incentives. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't stop us from leading the way, which is what I'm, my work is doing, to say there is a way that you can be absolutely practical and pragmatic. You, can, you never have to deviate or abandon your sense of reason. In, in fact, the ancient Greeks used to live with this idea that there were two languages to hold the conversation of life in. The one was logos, which is reason and logic and facts and details. And the other one was mythos, which is um, imagination and story. And what is myth except the well-intended um, craft of telling lies that, that come together to illuminate a more profound truth about yourself and about life? Whereas our modern paradigms of business, politics, and of religion actually co-opt facts about the human psychology and about the world and weave them together in something that forms uh, an illusion which is incoherent. But the incoherence has to be resolved inside our psychologies, which is why we're all unraveling. And so the trick is not to abandon the one in service of the other. We've already done that. We've abandoned our sense of mythos and poetry and symbology and metaphor for the cold reductionism of the world. And the answer is not the classic left-right argument in politics to then abandon reason and then run back into the arms of, of mythos. The ancient Greeks called it being double-minded, holding the conversation of life in both languages at the same time. And fundamentally, fundamentally, this is what this book does. It's like the work of Khalil Gibran. It's like the work of some of the greatest poets and the greatest philosophers. The greatest philosophers always had poetic turns of phrase. They always met you somewhere in the heart, not just in the mind. They wove stories where you could meet that story along the way in a symmetry with your own journey and your own sense of identity. And it's, it's that art to me which is a craft and calling of a bard, a myth weaver, a storyteller, the person that's responsible for making sense of the histories, illuminating a path forward, contextualizing the past and the future, and contextualizing the, the facts and details of the world alongside a positive narrative 
of growth, change, connection, purpose, belonging, meaning, vitality, renewal, etc. And this is my first foray into that experiment of exactly that. Okay, you mentioned, we, we touched on a couple of times, existentialism. And I remember when I was at my absolute lowest point <clears> in <throat> life, mid-30s, lost almost all the money I'd made before, retired from fighting, broke up with a long-term girlfriend, didn't know the direction of my life. And I, I really felt like I had a real existential depression. And for those that are listening that aren't you know, too familiar with existentialism, the way I understand it is, is, is a lack of meaning. So if I was devoutly religious, then, then I had my meaning through that. But you know, I wasn't at the time, so I, I didn't really have any meaning. And um, I actually love existential philosophy. My, my French mother gave me a hard time because I called him Albert Camus. But uh, Albert Camus, I love his writings and Jean-Paul Sartre. I just, I think there, there's so much wisdom there. And I remember being at my low point, taking my dogs out at two in the morning. And I remember thinking like, what is the point of it all? And then I remember I looked at the dogs and I <clears> thought, well, I love my dogs. We're out here playing. That's enough. You know, at least, at least I got to look after them. And then, you know, slowly I, I crawled back out of my, my hole and I'm incredibly happy now. But that, that idea, I think a lot of people today are struggling with that existential angst, right? Like, Young what is people especially. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yes. So from a practical perspective, do you have some advice for those young people yeah, yeah. that are struggling with me? Yeah. So again, in, in the parlance of the bard of this midway between craft and calling, the midway between logos and mythos, my answer would be wake up to orient yourself, wake up to the, the place that you stand, which is always in the tension of two opposites. Because really what you're talking about, if you run to the arms of religion or faith, then you can find your meaning, but you lose your sovereignty, you lose your agency in life. If you run to the arms of reductionism and science, you gain this illusion, actually, of uh, sovereignty and agency. But because you're untethered from a sense of meaning, what are you doing with that agency? which can actually lead to a deeper existential crisis because now you know that you're empowered, which was what Sartre's point was. He said, you're, you're so empowered, you can do anything you want, but the life has no meaning. So, I mean, this is the doorstep to nihilism, really. And young children today are nihilistic. They've fallen out of love with the folksy, quaint, outdated bullshit of religion, but they don't have the warm, engaging, initiatory touch that form of human community used to offer, which is initiation, rites of passage. So how do you, the, that was the reason you had an existential crisis. It's the reason I had an existential crisis. It's the reason some people's entire lives is a protracted existential crisis. It's because we never get guided through to anywhere where we want to belong. Those two things. Because if in a village context, in a tribe context, you actually want to belong to the adult circle. It's an ambition that has meaning because you get to play your part. And then you just have to show up and play by the rules and own your own bullshit. And then you can get initiated into that circle. There's a pathway. The door is open. When you take that away and you make the village priest or you make the church priest, the guy that does the initiations in this cold, ceremonial, dressed up, pompous way, He's a celibate man with no family. What the fuck does he know about uh, initiation into manhood? And then everybody in the crowd is clapping and cheering on. And then you see them conducting themselves in normal daily life and they're complete dickheads or idiots or they're shallow. So the, the initiation is meaningless. And the what I'm belonging to has no draw card for me. How can you not end up in an existential crisis as a young person? So the only answer I can offer is you need to subject yourself to an initiation process where you are in a group of people that know how to foster that initiation. And the only one I can think of, the only one I can think of that I advocate for young men is jujitsu. Yes. Because there you are on a path, there you are working against your own ego, there you are completely vulnerable and reliant to the goodwill of other people. You are watching community play out firsthand in a very real sense with no dress ups on it and you are crafting yourself honing yourself and you have to submit to the will of the group in some respect this illusion of sovereignty or i can do whatever i like i can become whoever i want to become is such a bullshit 
because it assumes we all arrive here as a blank slate ready to be written on. And the fact that we can't become something that we just look at in somebody else and make that our ambition, we then internalize as failure in ourselves. Whereas if you go to jiu-jitsu, you'll see all shapes, all sizes, people have different arcs of their journey. And even though it's not said to you verbatim, it goes into the subconscious and you suddenly understand we're all running our own race. Yes, there is an objective win and a loss in a comp or in a role, but this comp is one of many. This role is one of many. It's not all going to be won and lost here. Ego isn't the thing that you think it is. It's necessary, but it, you, you need to grow up into the conversation that you're in. And the conversation is with your own ego and with the egos of other people that have earned their right to stand with the way they are. Look at a black belt. You know, you cannot like them person as a person, but you can't deny the presence, intentionality, and discernment that that person has invested into their own journey. And they've got something to teach. You know, everybody has something to teach. Everyone. Because sometimes what you're learning in jiu-jitsu is not jiu-jitsu. You're learning a subtlety about exchange with people or about intimacy or about trust or about vulnerability, not, no less your own. So the sad thing is there's not many of these initiatory practices for young people. Uh, jiu-jitsu is one of them. I know boxing gyms can be like that. They can be. But then again, the ugly side of it, everything has a shadow side. And I think MMA is the shadow side of that, where the intentionality is to canonize people like um, Conor McGregor, which however good he might be at his craft, his ethos and his presence is not the kind of person that I would call an elder or a custodian that can actually guide people or be followed as an example to emulate because they're all going to end up as um, self-promoting cockheads. Mm. And we don't need more of those. That was beautiful. I uh, couldn't agree more with what you said about jujitsu. <laughs> And I know a lot of people, especially like me, like old school people that was watching, they were watching UFC in the early days and Pride in Japan when that was the best show. A lot of them are like very turned off by modern MMA and the fact that because Completely. Conor made so much money from his antics, so many other people are following suit. But there's a beautiful backlash. Like there's there's incredible champions and ex-champions. Like I just watched a fight with um, Charles Oliveira, former champion, and he walks in the cage and before he fights his opponent, not only does he does he shake his hand and give him a hug and kiss his cheek, but he goes through three corner men and gives them all a hug and a kiss and then gets ready to fight. I thought it was just such there's those beautiful moments. Just like, you know, you're about to risk it all. And it was it was the shot for a for a title shot, the fight, huge stakes, and millions are watching, and there's so much, so much on the line. And just to see that beautiful humanity, you know, or there was one where there was um a Korean fighter, the Korean zombie who retired. And the whole arena was just singing his walkout song as he left. He lost, he lost the fight, but it was just such a beautiful moment. It made me almost, almost tearful. So you still have those beautiful moments in there, but I, I know exactly what you mean. Um, and I think that looking back at my life, two things that I think I really want to share with my son and any young person is that the martial art journey was just, God, what a gift that I had that, that gave me so much. But the other thing is in a world where you have so much coming at you, in order to discern what to listen to, what to not listen to, what seems like it's on the right path and what is obviously bullshit, I think I had such a good face from just reading widely at a very young age and having that a consistent habit for two and a half decades. And I think that that just you, the more you read and learn about certain things, the more you can just tell who's real, who's a real deep thinker, who's got good ideas to listen to, and what is just you know crap. And I think that that's such that yeah. that's two really good pieces of advice for young people. But it's also incredibly hard. You know, martial arts and jiu-jitsu is not easy, and um, yeah. having the discipline to leave your technology and and go in a quiet space and read a read a book for an hour <clears> just, <throat> and really trying to get into deep work is something that I think is a, is a lost art. And that's something that I've noticed yeah. with myself that I'm really determined to get back is my concentration to be able to read deep work. It, it used to be incredible. Presence. It's, it's yeah, presence. And it's it's really, I've really struggled with that. So that's it, it's <clears> like those don't wish for an easy life, wish the strength to endure a hard one. All the things that have the the sweetest fruits tend to be difficult things. And that the easiest yeah. thing is to sit there lying on a sofa watching crap Netflix for hours or just scrolling on a social media app for an hour. That's so easy, but it just leaves such a bitter fruit when you're done. Yeah, you're right. You know, I'm mindful of what the advice that we can distill out of this for younger people beginning their journey. And it's that, first of all, anyone who's prescribing you a path or a thing that you should do, 
you need to take with a pinch of salt and be mistrustful of because no one knows where you started from. No one knows the obstacles in your way. No one knows the length of your journey. The biggest, the best advice is actually it's in this book. I don't know if you've read the whole of it. Yep. Towards okay. the end, you know, um, somebody actually asked me, how do I turn this into practice? You know, and I was just about to be prescriptive and I thought, no, that's the wrong thing. Rather speak to them about, about their stance about how they're facing the conversation of their own lives in all manner, in all times. Because if you start doing that, your nervous system will calm down. Your psychology, the racy psychology will calm down. And you'll have the space to make your own choices. And guess what? You're not only going to make the right choices, you're going to make mistakes. That's the first wake up call, the first rite of passage reality or realization that comes to you is you had this illusion that if I follow, how did Joe Rogan become a podcaster? How did so-and-so become a black belt? How did, I'm just going to do what they did. You can't just do what they did because you don't have their gifts and talents, all their opportunities, all their obstacles, all their handicaps, all their, and they don't know enough. They're not discerning enough to when they hand over even well-meaning advice to know that certain things are not the actual formula. It was just they, they they correlated and guessed that it was the thing that mattered. It turned out to be something else. You know, they're just, everyone's, it's a crapshoot. But what you can do is you can start becoming your own, your own teacher because if you break up your life into months, first of all, you can count how many months you've got to make a difference in life. And then at the end of every single month, you can simply stop and ask yourself, what would I, if I had my time again, what would I keep doing? What would I start doing and what would I stop doing? What is still serving me that I'm proud of that I want to build on? What do I want to begin so I can start turning the ship on the water and leading a way that, that I believe in? And what do I need to work on stopping or reducing or moderating in my life that is not serving me? What were my wins? My, what's worth celebrating that I've worked on this last month, this last six months? And what are my griefs? What are the things that didn't work out the way I wanted to that I need to sit and honor and reflect on and be present with for a moment in time? Because if you can't acknowledge your wins and your, your griefs, how could you possibly answer those questions honestly about what you would like to keep, what you would like to stop, and what you'd like to start? And there begins a meandering journey month after month where you start charting your own course, following your own heart, following your own discernment, following your own presence, becoming your own man and your own master in this world. And it's not just for men, it's for men and women. But you become your own adult, you become your own elder, you become your own custodian, you become your own visionary, your own pioneer, you become your own storyteller because you're now weaving a story month on month on month on month. And the arc of that story is becoming me, actualization, finding my own authenticity, finding my own integrity. And the only way to find that, this is an excerpt from um, a longer poem by, uh, I think he was a Spanish poet called Antonio Machado. He said, traveler. Your footprints are the path and nothing more. Traveler, there is no path. There is no path. The path is made by walking. By walking, the path is made. And when you look back, when you look back, you'll see a road never to be trodden again. Traveler, there is no path, only trails across the sea. That's an excerpt from the Traveler by There Is No Path by Antonio Machado. And that really encapsulates the journey that everyone can be guiding themselves along without knowing which way you're going because you're just following the, your own star in the sky. You're just using your own heart as the compass mm. and your own cares and troubles in the world as, you know, to, to chart your course. And what else can any of us do? I really love that. It reminds me of that saying, like, you know, no one's better at being Rocco Jarman than Rocco. No one's better than being Lawrence Dunning than me. And so many times it, it's so easy. It's that human trap where, you know, I, I look at someone who is an incredibly successful author and podcaster, um, Tim Ferriss. I'm like, oh, I wish I could have his success. That's how I, my old self used to think. And now I realize how incredibly lucky I am that I'm in such a good relationship and I love my wife and son. And he's looking for that. And he's, he's had a lot of battles with depression. He talks about all this openly. And, and I realize mm -hmm. that it's so easy uh, to look at one aspect of someone's life 
in one thing that you want to improve on and have that feeling of like, oh, I wish I could get there, you know, jealousy or envy or whatever it is, without realizing that, as Nabil Ravikant said, is, is that such a silly thing to think about because we're, we're discrete packets and we all come together. And and the really important things and the kind of the sort of you started talking about in the beginning of this, the really important things that money can't buy and is a calm mind, a healthy body <clears> and a loving family. And that's what we should be striving, not Instagram followers, not zeros in a bank account at the expense of all these other things, not, you know, fake friendships and fake prestige and all, all these things that so many people chase in the modern Western world that really, it, it takes a long time, but when you get some wisdom, you realize they're all meaningless. And on that note, there's a fantastic book I want to recommend. It's called With the End in Mind by Catherine Maddox. And she's a, a hospice nurse and she's talking about or I'm just finishing it for the second time, but I read a little piece every every night before bed, and it gives me so much appreciation for life because she talks about these stories about people, you know, coming to the end of their life and how their families cope and the things that they're thinking and the way they wish they they could do things differently if they had time. They don't have time, but you, me, anyone listening, we do have time. And I That's love right. what you said about being your own alchemist and figuring being your own mentor, because it's so easy to look at these other mentors. Like you said, they're these fantastic podcasters who they might have good wisdom, but they a lot of them are, you know, Peter Pan. They have no responsibilities. They have no families. They're in their late 40s. And they're just like, yeah, it's easy for them to have their three hour morning routine. You and I are not doing that with our toddlers, you know. So yeah. it's just it I really, I really like that philosophy. I, I couldn't agree more. Do you know, Lawrence, that book that you were talking about? It, it's really a, a meditation on, on regret. Mm. And, you know, we, we get one chance to spend our life well, and it's right now, right now in this moment, because you're never going to have this moment again. And you can waste this moment and a whole sequence of moments worrying about trying to be more like someone else so that you can be validated, so that you can be accepted, so that you can feel fulfilled. And Jim Carrey said he watched his father fail at doing something he didn't love but he didn't have the courage to try and be himself. What would you like to do at the end of your life? Would you rather say, I played it safe and I got there? Or would you rather say, I knew where I wanted to go and I didn't get the whole way there, but I don't have, I didn't leave anything on the field. I, I lived my life my way and I, I didn't, it wasn't un unapologetic like I gave myself a license to be an asshole to everyone. I gave myself a license to make mistakes. Yes. to be imperfect, to figure myself out along the way. And instead of reaching that end in the in the hospice bed where all you can confront is your own regrets, you get to revisit them piecemeal, one cup at a time, every month, as per the book, to say, what if I had my time again just this past month, what would I keep? What would I stop? What would I start? Because there is no way, I've got this radical idea which I can't, I can't prove to be true from here, but if we both do it and we meet back here a year from now, I can prove it to be true. And that is you can shape your past. It sounds so paradoxical. How do I shape my past? Let me tell you how you do it. You begin today. You commit to a journey of authenticity and integrity. You start a conversation with yourself that never ends. You ask yourself regularly, what does love look like right now? And at the end of every cycle, call it a week, call it a month, maybe both, you you say to yourself, what would I do if I had my time again? And then you give yourself many opportunities to revise that commitment, that that guidance to yourself that becomes your user manual for the next packet of life, the next month. And you do that for, for 52 weeks, for 12 months. Now, you can't choose where you're going to end up. You can't choose where you're going to end up a year from now from today. You can't shape the past that you've already walked to get here today. But if you begin living intentionally like this with presence, intentionality and discernment, focused on your own journey, your own life, your own authenticity, a year from now, the person that pulls into port and comes with their, their, their captain's log and says, this is what I've done. This is how I've, I've, I've angled my journey. Suddenly you realize a little bit of free will actually did open up in the world. Suddenly you realize now you're stepping towards your destiny. Now you're not just handing life as it, uh, uh, you're not just accepting life as it's handed or as it comes. And the argument is very hard to refute 
that a year from now, if you behave like that and you live like that, which it's it's not difficult because you're giving yourself all the permission in the world to fail and try again. There's no perfection required. If you live like that and you look back a year from now and we disembark and we swap notes, you will see evidence of the fact that you have shaped the past. You've shaped the past year, which is going to set you up as a launch pad for where you go that you could never have to a destination you could never have aimed for from here. Mm. Now, that's the advice I give to everyone listening to this. Stop worrying about how you're going to play out the whole of your life. That question is too big for you to answer, and you're not the wise person that you will yet become to be able to even tackle that question. Rather, just figure out how you're going to live with presence, intentionality, and discernment just for the next year. Just set your sights on that destination and live more fully in this moment with all the calamity and the drama and the dysfunction and the, this is, you, you chose to come here on some level. You're here now. You woke up in the VR simulator of life and you got handed Lawrence. I got handed Rocco. Somebody else got handed Victor or Jen. You, how much energy do you want to invest? How much time, so not time, how much attention mm. and energy would you like to invest in wishing you had been given somebody else's character to play? Just, you've got one crack at this and you can renew that. You can start the role again every month and say, how was my last role? How did I want to show up? What would I want to do next time? How do judokas learn? They, they learn by one role at a time. If you try and put someone on a mat and just give them lesson after lesson after lesson and video and podcast and book on jujitsu they're not going to learn jujitsu but you roll your way to integration you integrate your way to actualization you don't just actualize by by trying to emulate synthetically what someone else does it's such a a poor substitute for for one's own journey and so my argument is you can shape the past by how you live the present with intentionality, with presence, and with discernment. And what, a, what an empowering prospect, which means if one person can do it, a family can do it. If a family can do it, a city can do it. If a city can do it, the world can do it. Yeah, that's so beautiful. Rocco, I think that's a great place to wrap this up. And, you know, I know we're going to do it again. I love talking to you. I always feel like I upgrade my thinking. And you, um, it's a great book. I recommend everyone check it out. I'm going to put a link on the show notes. But... Read it, enjoy it, and uh, leave Rocco a positive review on Amazon, please. Get you up in the algorithms. But it's uh, it's it's really, really wonderful. I enjoyed it dearly. The heart and the world. And Rocco, you're always, you're always so generous with your wisdom. And uh, it's always a pleasure. I know it's evening for me. You, you, you are sick. You're up at, at dawn to make these calls. So I always appreciate you fitting me in your crazy schedule. No, I really, really appreciate the opportunity to have what I believe was a spacious and nourishing <laughs> nourishing exchange about uh, a topic that can guide other people to that invitation, their own invitation to a more spacious and nourishing form of conversation with life, their own. Yeah. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Thank you, brother.